Today I'm going to talk to you about the pelvic floor. I'm going to take you through my three key training principles for pelvic floor rehabilitation. And I'm going to demystify why maybe basic Kegels don't work or I've tried my Kegels and it didn't help. I'm going to talk you through why if you haven't taken your pelvic floor to the gym, why there's still rehab potential and why re pelvic floor rehabilitation is still an option for you. So my three key training principles. The first is repetition and endurance. It's a high loaded area, it works all the time. We need to do high repetitions. An odd squeeze, an odd contraction here and there isn't gonna be enough. You gotta think about it like say your bicep. If you want bigger biceps, just doing the odd lift here, the odd squeeze while sitting at a traffic light, it's not gonna make a bigger muscle. We need to work on endurance, high repetition over a long period of time for that muscle to change. We need to put it under that stress and tell our body, you need to do more, you need to grow a bigger muscle. Repetition is really key for that. The very second and closely related principle is progressive load. So you would never with any other muscle in the body go, okay, 10 second holds 10 times and then 10 fast contractions and stay at that level for forever. You would expect your strength to build and therefore with that the resistance goes up or perhaps the repetitions goes up, how long you hold it for, how dynamic that becomes. You add some level of increased resistance to make that exercise harder so the muscle continues to get stronger. If we're still having a dysfunction despite doing pelvic floor training, well, there must be another level we need to reach. And so then your pelvic floor rehabilitation is going along with that. Make it harder, make your body stronger to cope with what it needs to cope with. And the third and final principle is the entire pelvic ring. So one of my all-time favorite physiotherapists, Diane Lee, um, often is seen describing the pelvis and the pelvic floor as a door frame and a door. So if we take your skeleton, that's the rigid door frame, and the pelvic floor underneath is the door. And in order for that door to close, in order to support pelvic organ prolapse, in order to close the urethral back passage and stop incontinence, you need a strong and stable door frame, and you need a strong and stable pelvic floor. The two together are essential. So if the pelvic floor is nice and strong, but the door frame is still tw twisted and not transferring load as it should, or there's still pain inhibiting movement, then that pelvic floor function is not going to be the best it can be. So let's have a little look at each of those in turn. So the first one we're going to talk about is um, the endurance of the pelvic floor. So we all need to start somewhere. We need to find that exercise that works, how to recruit all of the muscle layers. So there's several muscle layers through the pelvic floor, not just the ones you can feel on the outside when you squeeze and close and stop your flow of urine. That's related to your sphincter muscles and this long puborectalis, the most superficial of the pelvic floor. You can see behind that, you've got this big strong hammer creating a lift. So when you do your pelvic floor contraction, you should really feel a sense of a close and a lift, like at least two stages of a muscle contraction. So if we practice that together, I want to envisage these muscles. And imagine the puborectalis and the sphincters like elevated doors closing at the opening. So you're just pinching and sliding the pelvic opening close, pulling those muscles together. Have a try for me now. Think about breathing out, pinching and closing at the pelvic outlet, tightening around the sphincter, getting the outside muscles coming on and release. Okay, now next time we're gonna add in the deeper muscle. So now you're gonna close the elevator doors and then you're gonna lift up and inside, engaging the big elevator ani underneath, drawing that muscle contraction up and in, layer by layer. And then when you release, muscle layer by muscle layer comes down and then you let go of that superficial sphincter, that puborectalis, you lengthen and open the doors all the way back into the hip sockets. When you can do that, you have motor control. You can then start working on repetitions and endurance. But until the whole muscle is working together, there's no point working on the holds. 
contraction south ridge and only part of that muscle is working we don't really want to work, reinforce that by practicing that over and over again get your perfect contraction first time and once you can hold that the endurance starts for as long as you can hold it and as many repetitions before your control fades, before it gets weaker, before you find your breath holding, before it just fades away, before you're even wanting to relax, you've hit fatigue. That is your baseline. So that might be a six repetition of a six second hold to begin with. That's great. That's your fatiguing baseline. That is the key milestone for you to hit to start. Every time you do your pelvic floor contractions, it's a challenge for that endurance and that repetition. There's no set number. How long can I hold it for? And how many repetitions of that, at that great control, at that level, at that performance, can I do today? If you fatigue it, you can tick your pelvic floor exercises off for that day. And then the next day, you check it again. Can I go for seven? Can I go for seven seconds, seven times? You might stay at that for a little while, then you might hit to eight seconds, eight times. Why stop at 10 seconds, 10 times? That's not a functional measure. You go for as long as you can, so you're building your endurance. To change a muscle, to grow new muscle fibers, it takes at least 12 weeks of a training program. If we have a dysfunctional muscle, we often need to undo bad habits in order to get through the strengthening part. So in reality, in my experience, it often takes at least six months, so double the normal muscle growth time to change that muscle patterning, keeping at it every day and fatiguing that muscle. Now the very second principle and very closely linked is the progression of load. So just as the endurance builds and the repetitions build as I explained, so does the intensity. Your pelvic floor was never asked to just contract lying flat on your back. And actually if we only train our pelvic floor when we're lying down, it's likely that we're going to build tone in that muscle unnecessarily. Your pelvic floor does not need to work 100% when you're lying down. It needs to work 100% when you're stood up, walking, and an unexpected cough or sneeze come on. That's when you really need it. So that's where you train it. Sure, it's easiest to start training the pelvic floor in lying, and that's where I train most of my ladies to begin with. If they can get a good contraction there of all the muscle layers, they can hold it without fading then I'm gonna get them out of that position pretty quick. So we're gonna maybe move into four point kneeling. Kneeling, standing, if we can do standing, we can do one leg. And if that is all easy, then we start to add the resistance. And resistance comes in many forms. So it's either lifting a weight, adding resistance bands to that movement, just adding your breath work, breathe out, control your diaphragm, which you move your pelvic floor. Or it can be, if you're a singer, Engage your pelvic floor and exhale and project your voice. It's a huge challenge. Maybe it is um, teaching, standing for a long period of time. So therefore I'm looking at, okay, how many repetitions of your pelvic floor are you doing in standing? I don't want you to have to think about the pelvic floor when you're working or when you're singing. So train it there in the gym. Train it in standing a lot against that endurance, against that resistance, so you know it's fit for the job. So when you go running, when you go singing, when you're teaching and standing up for hours on end, it is strong enough to cope with that. If we just do our pelvic floors lying down and then expect it to be able to work whilst we're running, it doesn't really cross over. And that's where we move into our third training principle. And that's talking about the entire pelvic ring. So if we're lying on our back, and our pelvis is probably rotated backwards with that, then the pelvic floor gets really good at working in that position. But if then when we stand up, our pelvis maybe rotates forwards, it doesn't know what to do in that position. Equally, if we always have symmetrical load going through the pelvic floor left to right, when we're running and landing on one leg and the load is altered, does the pelvic floor know what to do in that position? So we need to make sure that the whole pelvic ring is working well and that the pelvic floor is working with the pelvis. We talk about stability and strength. Now that doesn't mean keeping things still. That means having strength as the body moves through range and then that strength and that activation is dependent on the load that we put through it. 
So the pelvic floor isn't either on or off, but it's on at an intensity that's relevant to the task you're asking it to do. So if we're talking about the pelvic position and the position that we're going to train the pelvis in, we want to start with symmetrical load left to right and also in a neutral pelvic tilt. So I often use a band to describe that. So an, uh, a position I often see um, in, in women and in men is a posteriorly rotated pelvis. And that will often come from long periods sitting at a desk where we're rotated backwards, tail tucked under, pubic bone prominent. Also, I see this most often after um, pregnancy, when we're sitting and feeding, when the pelvis is open to deliver a baby, the sacrum often drops down and moves into a nutated position, and the posterior ring is open. So what that does to your pelvis, when you're in a neutral position, your pelvis is sitting here, the pelvic floor is sitting here, when you tuck your tailbone underneath you and slouch back, you can see the tension in the pelvic floor has gone. It's gone all droopy and soft. Now if I tip my pelvis forwards again and move my tail away from my pubic bone, the pelvic floor pulls taut once more. So we don't want to train the pelvic floor here. It, for one, it's going to be really hard to take up all that slack. But also if we train it there and we make it strong in that position, really hard for us to anterior rotate which is a natural motion for running and for walking so what we need to try and do is, try, is strengthen our pelvic floor with the pelvis in a neutral position and that's where the tension is most easily created but that's where the function is as well if there's any ongoing pelvic pain, lumbar pelvic pain, uh, pubic pain, hip pain, then we can have muscular inhibition. So in the presence of pain and inflammation, the muscles are gonna really struggle to work. And so we need to address those pain, those pain issues. We need to seek therapy and treatment to resolve that as quickly as possible. Only then are you gonna have optimum muscle function. So if you, work through the program making sure that you have optimal pelvic ring closure and ring performance that you work on your endurance and you're progressively building time under tension and you progressively increase that load be it external with weight with a extra functional challenge or even with bits of kit such as the pelvic toner which i love it's like a, a resistance weight for the pelvic floor then you know you're working well on a progressive pelvic floor program and that is pelvic floor retraining.